Hello and welcome to Reinfuse. Today we are taking a look at this, which uh, <laughs> just looks like a, a piece of circuit board. It is in fact an implementation of uh, Stephen White's Pi 1541. Now, the Pi 15.1 is an emulation of a Commodore 64 disk drive, as the title suggests, the uh, 1541. And uh, also, as the title suggests, it connects to a Raspberry Pi. Because uh, why not? That's, uh, <laughs> everything should, should connect to a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and this basically acts to fully emulate the 1541 disk drive. Now, there are obviously a lot of solutions for uh, digital uh, loading on the Commodore 64, things like the SD2 IEC, for instance. But uh, where this differs from those solutions is that it does, like I said, fully emulate the uh, 1541 disk drive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the 1541 disk drive was effectively a computer all on its own. It had a CPU, the 6502, same as a lot of machines, actually, and uh, more importantly, the Commodore itself. The It's got its own memory, it's got its own ROM, uh, and it's got its uh, own I.O., ports and what have you. So it, it's a full computer, it's just not designed to display stuff on the screen on its own. Now a lot of the other solutions, the SD2 IEC included, they really just kind of act as an in-between between the uh, disk images and the Commodore. So they don't do any emulation as such, they, they literally just kind of feed data in. Whereas this is, because it's designed to fully emulate that drive, it acts exactly like that drive does. Now the fact that it was a full computer was uh, taken advantage of by a lot of the game manufacturers. So they used it to spe do special turbo loaders or to do um, like encrypted loaders and, and some and forms of copy protection. And because of that, those games, uh, as they are, do have an, an issue running on, on those other solutions. Now, there are obviously there's hacked ROMs and stuff which let them run. But it does mean that you get to run those exactly as they would have run on an actual 1541 drive, which is pretty cool. Plus, of course, the other benefit is that you can literally, as I have done here, build one yourself. Now, I was kind of lucky in that because I do a lot of computer repairs, I just had all this stuff hanging around the house. So um, for me, this was effectively zero cost. Uh, I mean, potentially I'd use those components on something else, but effectively it was zero cost. And but it is still fairly cheap to build anyway. I mean, a lot of these components are optional. Really, the only one, the only couple of things you need is this uh, these voltage converter here, which is probably the most expensive part as well. It's uh, an Adafruit one. This one. Um, there's probably all alternatives out there, uh, and it's about well, anywhere between three and six pounds. I've seen it for, uh, and at the header on the bottom, <laughs> which uh, you can get for a few pence. And those really, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, and obviously the DIM plug to actually connect it to the Commodore as well. But really, those are the things you, you actually need for this. You can do away with pretty much everything else if you want to. And it's really just a lead to connect the Commodore to the Pi. Uh, well, obviously, wiring up, you've got to be very careful with that. You can see quite a lot of those bodge wires. And again, most of those bodge wires wouldn't exist if you didn't have the buzzer, the light, and all these switches. I'll explain the switches a little later on. But it's really, it's wiring this up. Now, I didn't do this right. <laughs> I accidentally inversed this header. So what it means is when mine connects to the uh, the Raspberry Pi, let's get this right. I did cut off a bigger header, so there is a kind of a rather ugly bit without pins in it that you've got to make sure you don't accidentally put in there, otherwise everything will go wrong. So yeah, mine looks like that, which, yeah, as you can probably guess, was not how I designed it to look. It was rather more designed to be over here and go over it so it makes more of a neater package, but it still works, so it's fine. <laughs> now, you can just go off to eBay and buy uh, a Pi 1541. That's no problem. There are schematics available just to make a PCB. We are, in fact, doing our own one that's got more options than this, so it's got actually the uh, the DIN6 plug, so you can have pass-through for other devices and stuff. And obviously, once we finish that and we've tested it, it will be open source, as all of the reinfused stuff is. But um, yeah, building one yourself is is definitely possible. Uh, it doesn't require a great deal of skill. It just requires patience and time, effectively. Right, so 
there are two methods of loading disks from this device. The method which I actually use is uh, the image for the Raspberry Pi, which you can get from the, uh, I'll include the link obviously to the project in the comments. And that's also got the image for the Raspberry Pi. Um, well, it's got the software for Raspberry Pi. You have to, it gives you instructions how to build it. It's fine, it's, it's not hard. <laughs> and so this uh, comes with a program called FB64, which is a file browser. And that means you can kind of pick the images on the Commodore itself. That's how I do stuff. Now, the only issue with that one is uh, the Commodore doesn't like displaying lowercase. You can switch it by pressing the Commodore and shift and it will switch the, the character set and it will display them. But otherwise, it's got nasty characters unless you make all your files lowercase, which actually I did just for laziness. Um, the other method is you can literally just plug a monitor into the Raspberry Pi and then it will display on another screen. So you can have a separate screen and you can choose your images that way. It's, it's a lot faster, obviously, especially if you plug a keyboard in as well. Now these buttons here, these do replace the keyboard. So you can use these buttons to move around on the menu for, on the Pi as well. But uh, yeah, like I said, I, I use the Commodore one. It works pretty well. I've not had any problems with it. Now, they basically recommend that you have the disk images on the Pi drive it the disk itself and uh, I mean that'll work and you can obviously you can change the size or, or how much space the actual Pi image uses between you know and how much storage space you've got but I've uh, used this external USB there's apparently issues doing it this way but I've not actually encountered any yet and what it means is I've got now a huge quite cheap <laughs> method of just of, of storing effect well I've got every single disk image for the Commodore 64 on there so um it definitely uh it's definitely worthwhile trying it. Uh, in terms of the Raspberry Pi, it's mostly centered around the Pi 3, which is obviously now the previous generation of Pi. I haven't seen anything about it being tested on the Pi 4. The actual uh, creator doesn't think it will work because of some of the changes that the Pi 4 did to, to its expansion and what have you. Um, don't know, I might try one at some point. I haven't got a Raspberry Pi 4 yet, but I, I almost certainly get one. I've had one of every generation, so that's almost certainly going to happen. Uh, they do, they have also done some work getting it working on the Pi Zero, uh, and it does work, um, apparently quite well. And that would obviously make for a very, very compact unit. And I think you see a lot of those on, on eBay because they, they'll come, they tend to come in rather nice boxes, which is one very good reason for buying it from eBay. Um, and they're quite compact. There's a couple of like mini versions of the 15 volt one, which look very nice. And I might end up just buying one of those anyway. Um, well, unless I fix my 3D printer and do my own one. But anyway, let's take a look at how this looks like on the actual screen. Right, with the Pi 1541 in the serial port on the back of the Commodore 64, you should get this, just the completely normal boot screen. Everything's worked fine. And now we need to load up the file browser. Now, if you look at the archive that you'll get from the project homepage, you'll see there are several like FB images on there. So FB16, FB128. And the one we want, obviously, if you've got a Commodore 64, is the FB64 one. If you just include that one, you can just do uh, a load star and it will load that up automatically. But the other thing we can do is, uh, again, because the 1541 was, uh, and if you're, if you're a Commodore buff, this is telling you something you definitely know. Because uh, it was a computer, the way it used to do directory listings is it used to create a small program when you asked it for a directory listing, which we do using the dollar. So eight is the device number, and that's actually set in the config on the Pi 1541. And uh, there's like a small text file where you can make some changes. So if we do that, and it will say it's searching, and then it will say loading, and then ready. So if we list that, we get a small basic program with all of the, <laughs> all of the things on our actual USB disk or internal SD card, depending on what you're using. So we can see that uh, FB64. So we could just do load FB64, comma eight, but we can, because it's the only one we've got, we can just do load star, comma eight, which will load that one thing. So yep, searching and loading. And once it's loaded, there we go. We can now run that and we get our FB64. Right, we can control this uh, using the cursors on the Commodore. So uh, let's just go for A. Now there is drive noise. You won't be able to hear it because you have the option. Uh, and again, this is something you can set in the config.txt file. You can have the audio coming out of the Raspberry Pi's audio socket. 
which is a really good option, especially if you're doing some kind of recording, like maybe for YouTube, or if you're, you know, you happen to have something lying around like a piezo buzzer and you want to use it in your project and you forget that you're going to be at some point recording for YouTube, you can use that and you won't be able to hear that. So <laughs> guess which one I did. But anyway, there is drive noise, just like you do on the get on the GoTech. Um, it's, it's very useful, but you also get a flashing light as well, which is arguably more useful. But it's still cool. So uh, it's an action biker, maybe. I don't know. So if we click into that, that doesn't load the game. That basically mounts that disk image. So we can load this now. We can click on an image and load it. Or we can do Q. And we can, again, if we do the load $8, which again is our directory listing file, and it will search and it will load it. And if we list that, it will now, oops, it will now tell us there we go, so that's what's on that disk. So we have now mounted that disk, so that's what it believes is in the drive. We can just load star, should load up the correct image. We can put in the full name, and the light's going and the pizza buzzer is making noises to show that it's loading. I will probably have to speed this up. This does load pretty much exactly the same rate as the 1541. I wonder, it might be faster if you get the Jiffy DOS ROM. You can change the ROM that the, it uses. This is using the box standard 1541 because for historical purposes, I wanted to try that out. Um, I wonder if it is faster using the Jiffy DOS. I would have to test that anyway. <laughs> right, there we go. Some load up faster than others. Um, some just load up a loader. And then when you run that, that actually then loads from the disk properly. But this one, I think has probably loaded the whole game. So if we do run, Oh, blimey. Hello. <laughs> okay, so that must, I'm, I'm guessing that's some kind of uh, compressed, yeah, so that's decompressing, I would assume. I'm more of a Spectrum Guard than a Commodore guy, I will admit. Although I have uh, got a new love. Ah, there we go. I have got a new love for uh, Commodore 64's since only one. Um, but I will admit, not as much love as I have now for Amstrad, which, yeah, <laughs> did not believe I would ever be saying that in my life. Huge rivalries <laughs> between Commodore Sinclair and Amstrad people in my school. And uh, yeah, I probably would. I kind of wish now I had an Amstrad as a kid rather than a Spectrum. There you go. Right. Uh, oh, it's got a trainer on it. Let me just start the game. Oh, hello. I've never played this game before. I also don't have a joystick installed, and this doesn't really... If I recall correctly, the Commodore wasn't really a big keyboard. Oh, but it works. That's fine. Oh, look at that. This is very pretty. Never played this game before in my life. I'm going to be playing a lot more Commodore 64 games now, which is... Um, which I'll admit, has, up to now, has been uh, an eye-opener. So uh, I'm kind of looking forward to it. So uh, yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> now, in terms of multi-disc, it's obviously possible, but you really do have to use the Pi connected to a screen option for that one. And it means you can just change the disc on a separate screen whilst you're kind of still running the program. Um, but yeah, it does work. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I generally, uh, when I was testing it first of all, because I didn't know about the weird character issue if you have lower, if you don't have lowercase files, that's yeah. Um, this is a fantastic solution. I mean, genuinely, the um, it's kind of really nice that I built it myself. That's always fun, but the fact the fact that it works like it does and how well it works is astonishing. Uh, Stephen White has created an amazing bit of kit, and it's a fantastic use of a Pi as well. Um, Obviously, you need to own a Pi. Well, that's the one thing I missed out. I just kind of assume everyone has a Raspberry Pi now. That's not going to be the case. But yeah, Raspberry Pis are relatively cheap to get. Um, and uh, the components to build one yourself are relatively cheap. But again, they don't cost that much from eBay either. So it's um, it, you might find it's worth investing. Uh, but if you do want a, a nice, simple, but involved electronics project that you can kind of have almost an instant feedback on it working. This is definitely one worth trying. And we will get our own PCB schematic up at some point as well. We, we tend to design it and then test it before we release it to open source, but it will be open source. Right, 
thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please hit like. If you really enjoyed the video, please hit subscribe. If you didn't enjoy the video or you have something else to say, then please leave it in the comments below. I've had recently a lot of people have been um, commenting on my videos with their kind of their stories of the hardware that I'm covering, and I I, I love that. That's genuinely my favorite part of doing all this stuff. So please, if you have memories of com of using the Call of Duty Four as a child, definitely tell me about them. It's it's, it's really nice having the knowledge of somebody who used these at the time because there's a lot of these machines I didn't use at the time the Commodore being one of them I mean I had a friend who owned one and so I had some use of it but I didn't own one and it's a very different experience um, my the Tate and Einstein is, is the big one where I've had a couple of people who have given me their memories of owning them uh, when they first came out and it's it's just brilliant it's, it's really nice knowing those those stories but yeah and uh, yeah, check out my other videos. Uh, please uh, share as well so we can get more people looking at stuff. But yeah, see you next time.